<laughs> okay. Okay, we're recording. Awesome. Hello, everybody. Today I'm here with Jan Luther, and I'm so, 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 so happy to have her here on the podcast finally because she's one of the most amazing souls that I know. She's so loving and so kind, and I love her so much, and I'm so happy that I could bring her to you today here. So, hello, Jen. Welcome, and introduce yourself, and what do you do? Awesome. Thank you, sweetheart. It's, uh, we've been talking about this for a while, so it does feel like it, it's time has come, finally. So, um, And likewise, we have just had such a, a great connection and such a bizarre one of those, you know, social media works. <laughs> so that would be great. Um, I am one of nine US EFT master practitioners and EFT stands for emotional freedom technique. So that's kind of my foundation. I have um, a healing background. I am a Reiki master. I have uh, for a long time been working with emotion, energy body, trying to get the mindset clear for people because um, I'm very much a student of the subconscious. And I refer to that as the ego mind, the, the patterns and the programs. And so the work that I do is to help people, first of all, recognize they don't have to be the victim to their thinking, to teach them ways that they can shift their energy, which takes them out of the brain driving the bus. By using this tapping, we are able to take it out of fight, flight, and freeze, which puts us back into the logical brain, where we then have some kind of autonomy and control. So... I work with grief, I work with couples. Um, I've pretty much done a, a thousand and one things. We sat down one time and made a list of all the things that I've tapped on with people and had results, sometimes like phenomenal financial. I've had some prosperity um, classes and groups that have just kind of make you scratch your head and go, wow. <laughs> Amazing the power of our subconscious when it's under our control. Absolutely. And like you said, you've literally been tapping. So <laughs> please get us into what is EFT? What does it do? Like, where does it come from? Give us a little overview. Cool. So EFT was created by Gary Craig. And the idea is that our body is a record. My interpretation, of course, <laughs> is that our body is a recording system. And so anytime we have an experience and, and basically from the time we're zero to seven, we are nothing but recorders and we are taking in all this information from our parents, from our surroundings, from our boo-boos, from mean people, from nice people, from right from the entire universe. We're just sponging and taking it all in and it starts to activate our subconscious mind. And what happens is when we have a belief running, for example, be careful on your bicycle. If it was a really traumatic fall and that isn't addressed, the child will be afraid of riding a bicycle or trying something new or being embarrassed whatever the aspect was that was painful or frightening for that child, those blocks are going to show up for the rest of their life and they won't even recognize that it started as early as six years old. So with tapping, what we do is we tap on the same meridian points that acupuncturists place needles in. And what Harvard has discovered by studying this is that when we do that, this energy starts flowing through our brain and our body and it's like we go from this tense, emotional wall, resistant fear energy that is blocking to this relaxed and calm and cognitive place. So every tapping point connects to an organ and every organ connects to an emotional system. So with this program, what Gary Craig created is instead of having to worry about learning all that, we just do an overhaul. <laughs> we tap all the main points and then we don't have to worry about which organ and which emotion and where is it blocked. I, I always like to tell children it's like squeezing toothpaste out of the tube. Right? That energy might be blocked in the back of my neck or in my hip or I'm having all that pain. And by just tapping all the meridians in this particular process and talking ourselves through it so we're getting the cognitive shift, the energy just starts flowing and the relief, usually within minutes, we can feel the relief. And when you said you were also explaining this to children, how old can you be when you can start EFT? I actually had an experience with my twin granddaughters when they were just less than a year old. Um, they had had tubes put in their ears because they just could not seem to kill this, you know, infection that they kept getting. And so they put tubes in their ears. When they came home from the hospital, she could not put them in the bathtub. And these had been children who would go bath, 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 bath. So clearly some kind of trauma happened or was registered in their system, in their subconscious mind, 
about bath or the sound of running water or, right, we don't know exactly what it was. But when I took my daughter and the grandbabies into my big old garden tub, because she called me, she's like, mom, no, <laughs> right? something is wrong with the babies. They stink, they can't get them to bath. So I tapped on one and talked her through, even though it sounds really loud, I just was doing intuition, right? It sounds really loud and I don't water on, don't, maybe I'm afraid of water in my face. And anything that came to me, which I can't, of course, remember now because it was in that intuitive moment. And I could feel her, first of all, she wasn't clenching, she was relaxing. And then we got her splashing in the water. And then I was reminding her that grandma and mama are right here. We're gonna keep you safe, right? Whatever was running on her subconscious plan and in her subconscious mind just started to soften. And then we got her feet in it. Then we got her butt in it. Pretty soon she was splashing and she never had a problem again. Same thing with the other one is I was tapping on them on some basic points. And then there were a couple places where I felt something <laughs> that I didn't know what it was. So I just tapped on myself. So if they're very young or they're very elderly, you can always tap on yourself or tap for them. But once they're like three or four years old and they can mimic the tapping and speak after you, they can say the words you're saying. Pretty much from three years old, I have an 80 year old client. So any age. That is so beautiful and so inspiring that everybody can do that. And it's, it's super easy. So also what I just quickly want to mention is that later on, like now you guys maybe heard all of this about tapping and then later on, we're actually going to show you what it's like to be tapping and we're going to do a sequence for you. So um, yeah, just, um, and in the podcast, if you're listening to the podcast, you can find it on YouTube. I'll link to it on YouTube. And if you're on YouTube anyway, hello, here we are. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Okay. So tell us quickly about your own journey. How did you get into healing? What moment was for you the moment where you said, okay, I need some healing? There are about a million of those, right? We all have those moments where it's like, there's a left turn or a right turn here. Um, I grew up, I'm the sixth of seven children, and I grew up in a very small town in Idaho. My father was a small town mechanic, um, poor right? I mean, I have pictures of my house. So I'm almost embarrassed to show anybody because it's like, you can tell we was them poor kids that with the torn shirts and then runny noses and whatever. Um, and there was alcoholism in my family. There was a lot of rage in my father and there was a lot of abuse, um, both physical and verbal abuse. And I came in as a sensitive child. I came in as a healer who all that energy just kept getting trapped in my system and I would hold my breath Anytime he'd come around, I'd hold my breath unless, he, unless I could sense that he was in that, okay, it's the safe daddy, right? As we get that hyper vigilance going when we're trying to learn how to operate. But all of that early childhood trauma led to a lot of depression, a lot of issues with pain. Um, by the time I was in my 20s, I had chronic back pain. Um, actually had a disintegrating disc that I had a chiropractor tell me, you won't walk after 40. You're going to have to have surgery on this. Well, P.S. P.S. Um, I've been able to heal that, and I walk and I actually do kickboxing two or three times a week. So, don't listen to those doctors when they say those horrible things to you. Um, exactly. Um, migraines, depression. I actually was hospitalized at one point with depression. My husband was in the Navy, so there was a lot of pressure on top of me, on top of all of this anxiety and trauma that was stuck in my system, and. So I, I started looking for everything. I went through some herbal training. I worked with chiropractors. I, right, as I, I was starving. So it was like this incremental path. And then in about 2000, I guess it was 1997, my husband retired from the Navy. And so all of a sudden we're thrust into the public world. We're civilians now without a job, without a place to stay, no idea, these four little babies. And it kind of was coming to a head, but I just said, well, I'll just get a job and I'll do whatever but I could feel it. I could feel that depression coming back. I could feel that anxiety coming back. I could feel this, that feeling that I recognized that put me in the hospital with depression before. I could feel the crescendo of all of this. And then six months later, my mother died. <laughs> put me in the bed. I was, I was out. And angry. Oh, so angry. It was like all the anger that I'd been taking in. And I had to literally bite my tongue all day long because I could feel myself trying to do what had been modeled for me. So it was a daily decision at first to just not spew out what I had taken in. And then I found tapping. And this amazing thing happened as I went to this woman and it was just one of those, I mean, back then nobody had even heard of this. This is 19, it was 2000, I guess it was. And as she's starting to show me what we're, what we're gonna do, I'm thinking, 
um, what kind of voodoo do you do? And I, don't, I don't understand this at all. But there were like six of us and I thought, well, I can't be the only one sitting here not, go, not doing it. So, so she had us pick a topic. I picked something very benign from a few years before, had maybe a five or six on it, um, started doing the process with them. And she was using very generic words. She wasn't asking me specifically for our topic. She said, I'm trusting your subconscious mind to bring up and release for you what needs to be released. And all of a sudden I started feeling this wave of anger and anxiety, and then it just broke. And I literally felt like energy chip fall off my shoulder and I gasped. I was like, what? Everybody looked at me and I was like, I don't know what just happened, but I need to know more about this. So I threw myself into tapping and over the next six to eight, six to eight weeks, actually, I, every day for hours and hours and hours followed Gary Craig on his, um, at the time it was VHS tapes, that's how long it was. <laughs> and day by day, I was literally feeling all this trauma that had been absorbed, all these angry beliefs, all these fear beliefs, all these self-loathings, all this stuff just started literally like scales falling off. So by the end of that year, I'm like, I have to do this. I have to teach people how to do this. My intuition was working. My, my, all these gifts and things that I'd been kind of resisting my whole life, it was like they were starting to really flourish. So that was the beginning for me, was literally throwing myself in to, I'm going to heal me, and then I'm going to teach others. And then in, uh, two, what was it, 2004, I guess it was, they had their very first master's training. And I was fortunate enough by 2005 to be one of the first EFT founding master practitioners um, who had actually been trained and worked with and, and got our certificate from Gary Craig himself. And then I was on fire. I was like, I, I'm going to go around the world. I'm going to be their top speaker. I was so zealous about wanting to help people out of their crap because I had suffered for so long by myself. And then in 2006, our son died in a car accident and kind of parked me, as you might say. So in that process, I realized two things. The first is life is going to keep giving you crap. And the second is you got to have as many tools as you can use. And we all need support. I called on a lot of other practitioners at that time because I was so caught up in my own subconscious mess, my own religious mess, right? All these beliefs about, but if you're good, and I should be exempt, and I couldn't get myself out of those things. So I was getting a lot of help through that time, and I started recognizing these patterns of, our, of my ego with grief, of how it really wants to hang on to these traditions of, I've lost a child, so this is now gonna define me as the mom who lost the kid, and, and the ego really wanted to almost revel in it. And it was really appalling to me to recognize how much of that was still in me, that, I'm the mother, you know, banner, hello, poor me. Um, so I started becoming a super student of observing what was happening in my mind and body as I was going through the processes of grief and the stories that my mind was telling me and how strong that hold is when your vibration is low because you're depressed and sad. And that became my new passion was now I am, I know that every day we have some kind of grief some of them are life shattering. Some of them are just annoying, <laughs> but they all leave an imprint. And with these tools, we get to choose the words we use to not only define them, but to chart our path going forward. And when you're speaking about these tools, what other tools are you using to um, help people with that? Um, energy healing. And, you know, I'm a Reiki master is where it kind of started. And I've developed my own form of doing that that I call divine love transmissions, which is recognizing that when we get that ego really tame and we're able to come to a full complete stop and get into the silence, you can do it with meditation, you can do it with prayer, you can do it with EMDR, you can write, there are a thousand different tools and I've learned a bunch of them, but my primary is using EFT to quiet my ego so that I can tune into that energy. And when we're in that space, in that void where all creation began, I've been able to actually help people heal physical things as well as emotional things. And then my other gift is through this process of getting really still and tuning into that space, my intuition, and I took an actual um, past life regression hypnotherapy course. I've been able to help people actually rewrite their future by healing their karmic patterns and 
releasing contracts that they have with themselves and with others. And that too has been just eye popping sometimes. So those are, those are the three primary things that I use. Yeah, that is amazing. And I know you also call, you also have an academy called the Ego Tamer Academy. So tell us a little bit more about that. I love, one of my gifts is, I have this gift that, that someone called the gift of reasoning, that I have this ability to, when someone is speaking, I can actually hear that it's the subconscious pattern coming forth. And I know it's a lie. I don't tell them it's a lie, but I can feel the discordance in their spiritual and physical body between what they're saying and what their higher self wants them to be um, embracing, for lack of a way to say. And so one of the things that I started doing was if I could teach people to do that, wouldn't that be cool? It's taken me 30 years. So the Ego Tamer Academy is basically, we actually call it your, the obedience school for your inner critic. <laughs> And it's like a three year process. You can do one year, you can do two, you can do three. But the process is we come together and I, I teach you what I have learned and I give you experiences, right? And it's not just, here's more information. There are thousands of amazing teachers and authors and whatever, but I actually put you through processes of catching your thoughts, changing your thoughts. I give, give you a reframe formula. I, I help you test your ego regularly. I have you interview your ego. I have all these processes that we do. And, you know, the, the basic one is, is really about getting to recognize that, yeah, I have this voice in my head that isn't me, and it's coming from somewhere. And while it's, I hate to use the word intelligence, but there is some form of intelligence in it because it can have a conversation with you. And so the process is within three years time, I have clients who are literally being able to do what took me 30 years to do. It's very cool. That is amazing. And, and what, is, what do they graduate then, so to say? What is that called? We haven't really created a graduation. Um, I guess because I haven't really gotten to the point of thinking that it wants to be like a certification or, or a graduation, but we are, are playing with the idea of having an official team of ego tamers. <laughs> and so the people who train with me in tapping, in my tapping, which is the ego tamer tapping, it's a little bit different. It's a lot different than the basic EFT because we are literally focusing on the spiritual aspects and the subconscious aspects while we're doing it. They become certified tet tapping practitioners and they become our, you know, our, our, um, I was going to say missionaries. I'm just going to use that word because I think everyone gets it. Our missionaries that go into the world and help people realize you are not at the mercy of your mind. Okay. And what is your mission then? Mm. I get emotional when I think about my mission because I remember so many days lying in that bed thinking I just wanted to die. And even with the tools and even with support, not understanding how our ego takes grief and trauma experiences. So my mission is to put this tool in as many hands as I can. And especially to change the way we speak about trauma and grief and loss. And the way we deal with trauma and loss and change and to empower people in a way that you have the tools that you need to get you in the with with you in the moment it's not just something that you got to go see someone again i want to empower people to be able to do this work for themselves and to share it with others if they're interested in it beautiful and i can tell you that jan is really great at it and also the way because i've worked with her too it is, um, she just knows what's in your, what's going on in your subconscious. Like she said, she can tell the lies, um, but she'll, she'll bring you through it and she'll make you break out of them. And she really is the ego tamer. I am always amazed by what she does and how she does it. And the best thing is that when you hear her story and when you see her, that she's so loving still, after having gone through all of this, you see that she's testimony of what she's doing. So that is a very, very beautiful part of that. So thank you for everything that you're doing here in the middle. <laughs> Just yeah, had to say. Yeah, I appreciate that. And um, so you're, you also have four um, aspects of your coaching persona. You want to get into those real quick a little bit. Yeah, I kind of talked about it a little bit. The first thing is because I am the ego tamer, every time a client comes to me, they're getting the part of me that can drill down to the subconscious and change. I mean, we literally rewrite the subconscious programming. And then there's the part of me that's the spiritual intuitive that I'm working on your energy 
the whole time. I'm loving at you. I always say people, I always tell people, can you feel me loving at you? <laughs> because that's really all that is. I call it a divine love transmission. And the beauty is when we're in that space where we're not letting ego direct us, direct us as coaches or leaders or even parents, but we're letting the intuition come in, the energy knows what to do. <laughs> we just have to hold the space and let that run. So I've got the mindset, I've got the energy healing. Um, my, my mind went somewhere. Oh, the emotional part, right, is being able to, to really understand how the emotions work in your, between your brain and your body. And, and then grief, right, is I am such a believer that grief is an everyday experience and that we have created some kind of, it's almost like our ego has done this because we have these traditions of how we mourn and how long it's allowed and how we're supposed to process it. But it doesn't really address, to me, the purpose of life, which is to dig down into the beliefs that are holding me in that pain, the beliefs that are making me judge, blame, <laughs> feel like the victim. And for me, that's the joy of doing the grief work is being able to help people recognize that when you pull these little pins out of all these false beliefs and they all just you know, fall apart, you're able to start building a foundation based on what your true faith is and based on what your experience is that you're starting to really tune into your higher self, whatever you might call that. So can you get a little bit more into this about grief being an everyday experience? In in because people may think about grief just in a form of you've lost somebody or you've lost something, an apartment or a car or whatever, right? Um, how is that an everyday experience? So I call it the TLC process. Right. Anytime you have something that's traumatic or a loss or a change, your mind has to adapt and your emotional body is going to follow. So, for example, with everything that we've been having on in our having every experience that we've been having in our world right now, the trauma of suddenly being told you can't go to work, the trauma of being told you have to school your children the trauma of being afraid for your life because there's this invisible thing out there that could kill you and you have to wash your hands and right so much trauma because our brain isn't used to being on such high alert and this process has literally triggered us into the fight flight and freeze all the time if we aren't doing something to calm that down we're in some state of grief it's giving us grief the second part of that is what we've lost when we feel like we've lost our identity our autonomy our safety our income, our, right? Anytime there's a, a trauma, there's going to be a loss with it. And anytime there's a loss, there's going to be a trauma about it because we're resisting. And then the last one is the change is the process for me when I'm thinking about grief and resiliency is when we have a trauma or a loss or some mag magic change that we didn't expect, we go into a state of rejection. Our wall comes up, we're pushing against the world. Our energy is flowing incorrectly that's grief, right? Is we're suddenly in this powerless, petrified, you know, hopeless space of my brain can't get around that. And then our brain literally goes through processes that I call the aspects of grief as we go through regrets. Well, if I did this, if I, if only that, and, and who do I blame, right? Is somebody has to be responsible for this. I need to get this energy off of me. And the process of grieving is literally going from that rejection and resistance to going through the things that I'm regretting and this imagined future and how, you know, how are things gonna be? And we're trying to write a future that we don't have enough information about and getting to the place where I'm suddenly, finally, hopefully completely able to say, I can now accept what is and I can adapt to that and forge ahead. And, and it's a literal, cycle over cycle over cycle but i but i know the aspects well enough that i can actually hear them as soon as the person starts speaking i go oh that's this aspect we need to ask these questions oh that's this aspect we need to ask these questions and by teaching people that it literally is an everyday experience for example i'm being prompted to share when a child is being weaned off a pacifier or a blanket we, we think of them as just being upset but they're actually grieving they're having to learn to self-soothe and adapt to what was when your first love ended or your last love ended, right? That's actually a grief process. There's a part of me that says, no, I don't like this. I don't want it. Which by the way, sometimes I'll do a whole series of just no's when someone is really traumatized because the body needs to get that energy out. And then we go through the process of, 
I regret, if only, what if, right? The wishing and wanting stages. And then we finally get to the place of, okay, I've worked it all out in my mind and I've come to the decision, which is really all acceptance is, that it is going to be this way and I need to adapt. It's time for me to move forward. So losing a job, same thing. What? No, blame you. It wasn't my fault. How? Right? All these processes, all these steps, these five aspects, every single time and in layers. And the beauty is once you kind of understand, first of all, how to sort it out so it's not so complicated, but also how to work through those questions and, and those five aspects, suddenly your body starts being relieved and your brain starts calming down because you're not feeling like you're being at war anymore. <laughs> so I'm not sure if that answered. Was that enough examples? Yes, absolutely. Um, and so I want to get into this because, so this podcast is a lot, you know, we share a lot of healing modalities. We share a lot about healing, but I also want to make sure that people understand that it's not always about healing, but it's also obviously about just living joyfully and not always finding this like, oh, I need to work on this. I need to work on that. I need to heal this. I need to heal that so I can be happy, blah, 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 blah. So it's not like you need to do this to get here, but how can you also just be here rather than having to uncover, discover, do whatever, you know? So my full 100% belief and experience and with thousands of clients is when we tame the ego and it's quiet and our subconscious isn't ruling, joy is the natural outcome. And I think for all of us, that's all, we're all seeking that in some form. And so it's not, I don't want to focus, I hear what you're saying, that I don't want to focus so much on that being this process to get to somewhere. Yes. To, to exactly. me, it's this taking of, of false, it's like false blankets off. I'm taking these weights off that are making me miss what's already beautiful right here, right now. It is impossible to be happy when you're hurting. And my goal with these is the more, the more like myself, the more I can heal everything that was hurting, the more happiness could finally start blossoming. It wasn't like I went out to get it. It was already in there. And it's already in every listener, that happiness, that sense of purpose, that enthusiasm for life, that a weird word, but they're giving me the word endurance, the ability to endure the crazy. It's in you, but it's under and behind and they're showing me a closet. It's buried behind, you know, <laughs> our junk closet. All the junk is what ego is telling you as an opinion about it, not the actual what is happening. And sometimes I really feel like that's like its purpose, right? Is it's to help us really dig and uncover what we really are. And I just I asked myself that in my head, you know, is it our purpose here in life to uncover all of this? And is this how we learn actually? Is, that, is it the reason why we have the ego, why we were given the ego, so that we actually learn happiness kind of in a way? The way that I would phrase that is I believe our purpose in life is to become more of our whole and healthy, I call it wholeness, right? Is returning to wholeness of of our pure divine self who can tap into that energy uh, that creates worlds in any moment and, and shift an energy, shift a mindset, be an influence in, an, in a chaotic situation where my peace invades the space, for lack of a way to say it, and it, it just exudes to a place where it triggers, inspires, envelops everyone that's feeling distressed to calm. So there's this element of, if I am my perfect soul and I'm disembodied, which I believe is eternal, there's no contrast. There's nothing that I can physically, viscerally, even mentally really learn at that point because I am all that. So when we come into these physical experiences, my perception and my experience, especially working with the Akashic Records, is that we do this specifically so that we can kind of rub off the, raw, the rotten spots of our karmic beliefs about being separate, about being limited, about being different than the other. And to me, that's a lot of what's happening right now in the world is this is a spiritual thing that we are up leveling at such a fast pace because so many of us are, I'm getting goosebumps, so many of us are finally getting to that place where our light is so bright that the dark has to fight back. It has to come out as, as rage. It has to come out as oppression. It has to come out as all of these things. And for us, the endurance part is 
being able to remember the higher goal, being able to, to focus on the bigger outcome of we get to write this the way we want it, but we can't stay focused on the pain and the problem without it triggering us. So we have to get into the stillness. We have to, and I, that's one of the few times I would say have to because it's either or. I cannot be in pain and be happy. I cannot be afraid and angry and judging someone and feel love, right? Those two just do not mix. They're, they're like opposite ends of the pole. And for me, it's to get to this middle place where I'm not triggered, I'm not led, I'm not, I, I call my ego dick because he's a dictator, <laughs> right? I'm not being told what that means and how it's wrong. I'm like, I'm not buying, no. And then the real joyful, holy, wholesome, whatever word you want to use, part of you gets to drive the bus and you get to see the world from a much higher perspective of, yeah, it's gonna always be here. It's part of the contract. But I don't have to join every argument, as they say. I don't have to be part of every battle. I can hold the energy of peace and love and wait for people to join me there. And boy, do they. When you find that, it's amazing how people like Jennifer show up. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Wow. That is, um, that is great. So how would you see that people are, do you think people are attracted to like the peace and the joy and the love, or do you think they have enough of what everything's going on or whatever? When, like, do you feel they're joining this side? Like when is this, when are they moving into the side of peace and wholeness? So I'm going to reflect the question back because I want to make sure I'm hearing what you're saying and, and the part behind it is, is it's almost like how do we know when we're moving towards peace and wholeness? Absolutely. When is the turning point? And, and the crazy thing is because it's a pathway, it's not like one point. It, to me, it is literally moment by moment, day by day, observing how I feel. And if I feel any kind of trauma, any kind of rage, any kind of fear, I'm out of alignment. I, I actually use this analogy, and I think I even have it on my Facebook page, is imagine that a negative emotion is literally like the rumble strip on the highway. That when I have this negative feeling, it's telling me I'm out of alignment with what's true to my higher soul self. So mm. if I start getting into this rumble. I just thought that was really funny. I'd never thought about that before, but right. It's all the rumbles in the world. If I get caught up in that, I'm going off path. And so for me, the emotional body is our alarm system. Starts as a little bit of smoke, then pretty soon it's a fire, then pretty soon it's a blazing fire. And, and the amount of pain is how you know if you're on your path or if you're getting off the sides. Mm, I, I love that analogy. That is, that is great. I love it. And I could feel it too, like just being off the path. Yeah, that, that is so true. <laughs> um, all right. So you do have a program that is called Healing Your Grief. And um, can you tell us a little bit about that? I would love to. I am so proud of this program. The interesting thing is I've been teaching grief and I've had reiterations of well, let's try the program like this and mm, there's something not right and let's do, no there's something not right and so this has really been like 15 years of trying little programs called it um, TLC3 tools love and coaching for the tremendous life challenges of trauma loss and change which was a great start but when everyone comes in and we're doing this great generic healing it doesn't really give the benefit of really focusing on your trauma the woman who's just lost her husband is gonna have five different aspects of her grief than the woman who's just lost a child. Her stories are gonna be different. Her identity is gonna, the challenges are gonna be different. So I've just been refining and refining. And what this program actually is, is this first one is called Picking Up the Pieces. It's the first step. And it actually, we presented this before COVID. <laughs> I actually did that, created this starting last year and we did it like early this year before all of this craziness happened. And it was just like, holy cow, divine timing, because this program is all about teaching you, first of all, I think there are six tools that I give you that are ways to use tapping that are so beneficial. Then we talk about mindset and how if we don't control that bugger, we're going to get off that road all day long, right? 
Then we talk about physical pain, right? The thing about that when we're not on the path and we're in the rumble strip, that pain intensifies the farther away we get from our center. And it literally becomes a physical pain. And the physical pain is a warning that we're off the path that becomes stress, that becomes disease, that actually becomes chronic illness. The statistics are crazy. When I first lost my son, someone sent me an article where they said that the mortality rate for a mother who's lost her child increases by like 400% in the first two years. Crazy. But they were able to do the studies and show that it might look like an accident, but because her energy and her intuition were off, this is my interpretation, <laughs> right? So we have to deal with the physical pain as well. Then I do one that's really fun where we talk about how other people have egos. <laughs> and sometimes they say things that are really hurtful. And we clear very generically, but also very specifically, because while I'm teaching generic, I'm instructing the listener, um, the person who's in the program listening to the video, I'm instructing you on how to get really clear with what your stuff is and how to make it measurable. And then the last step is really trying to take, you know, we've taken off this layer and that layer, we've taken off four really great layers, and now we're at a place where I want to purposefully help you experience what happens when you redirect your mind to what you do want and we go into gratitude and the vibration lifts and the energy shifts and the quiet mind and all the benefits of that. So this particular program is really non-grief specific. It's not to a topic or a type of loss. It's all my best tools that I'd want you to have and experience and heal from before you come to talk about loss, losing your spouse or losing your child or losing that job or having a chronic disease diagnosis that's gonna change the rest of your life unless you change your mind and energy. So this is like, I'm calling it the emotional first aid kit, right? This is the first thing. It's, this is the trauma and the shock. We gotta deal with that first. And the results have been astounding. I've, I've, I've been blown away by the miracles that are happening for the people who are participating because, and they're just doing the work, right? They're just Share, taking the lead. <laughs> Share some, what has happened for them? I have one lady who called in the first time from her bed. Um, she, I think she has like five different diseases, which of course I try not to anchor in my brain because I don't want to see her as that. <laughs> she has a husband with PTSD. She has three, two or three children, and then one that's a stepchild who are schizophrenic, suicidal, um, have Down syndrome, right? It's like, talk about, uh, and because her husband had PTSD, they ended up selling their house and moving in with her in-laws. So talk about, hello, how, how far can we fall down that staircase? So her first call, she called in from her bed, literally in pain, angry, upset, so ready for what we're, we, we're doing. After the first call, she texted me and said, I'm kind of thinking I want to see about doing some of this tapping stuff in the community. Do you think that's a good idea? <laughs> she reached out to someone who owned a healing center where she is, told her what her vision was, the passion carried forward. She got hired to work in a healing center, tapping, Reiki. There were like three or four things that she can do. And it was like within, literally within 48 hours of the very first session, which is the tools. It's not even really working through trauma. It was just teaching her the tools that she was getting so much relief from. Another one had, um, her husband had died several years ago and it was like, boom, boom, boom. Her husband, then her mother, then her father. Her son got married. I mean, it was just like, just talk about life changes all within like a five year period of time. And we had worked a little bit together before, but her too, the first or second session, she came in and she did exactly what I was, teaching them to do, which is what I teach the people to do in the, when you're watching the videos, it's the same thing. I, tur I turned them off and I talked, right? And she said she had this moment, and I don't remember what I said, but she said she had this moment where I said something about, if you believe in eternal life, then this is not forever. And I want you to have hope that you'll see your loved ones again. And she said it was like this weight came off of her neck and she felt this lightness. And then she said she heard her husband's voice tell her, babe, it ain't over. We're not done yet. Something to that effect. So she was in, right? She was all in for the rest of the course because huge shift. Somebody who hated the word ego by about the second or third time, we'd, we'd had a couple of exchanges 
and, and she started to recognize that it wasn't, I'm trying to kill it. It wasn't that I call it a demon. It wasn't, right. that's not the purpose. The purpose is it's running you unless you're running it. And suddenly she's saying, I can't believe this. I, went, I was driving home and I'm singing. Do you know how long it's been since I've just been spontaneously singing? Yes, right? She reached that place where she'd stepped out of enough of the pain that the joy just bubbles up. So, oh, so many fun things. And I can't wait to get more. That's the thing, because I, I, you know, I want to I get this in about a thousand more testimonials of people going, I can do this, because that's what that says to me. They're doing it. I might be offering the tools, and I might be holding the space, and I might be loving at them, but they're doing the work. I can't do it for them. Well, I amazing. That's good. And I can't wait for that to see it either. <laughs> We're going to link to the program, of course, in the podcast notes or in the YouTube comments below. And um, do you have anything else to share before we get into the tapping? I think the, the thing that's been on my heart today is, and I didn't even realize it was the word about endurance, right? There's a difference between enduring with night, white knuckles and enduring with hope and faith of going, it's going to get better. I want to keep affirming and feeling like things are going to get better. And so if, if there was one thing, listener, that you take away today, whether you check out the program or not, it may or may not be for you, whether you print out the really cool handout that we work really hard on and that you're going to love, I would have you remember that there is a part inside of you that knows why you're here right now. There's some purpose that you have. And if we can help you do it without white knuckling and being in fear and anxiety and panic all the time, oh, that's my goal. That is my 100% prayer is to be an influence for good, to be an instrument for healing, and to inspire you to find some way to recognize that inside of you is really everything you need. Beautiful. I love it. I just let that sink in also. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay so um yeah and then tell us real quick what is next for you next for me is i i really want to get this program in as many hands as possible because i know that if i have someone who's taken this i mean it's like a five-week process and each one is layer upon layer of taking some of the trauma out and teaching you how to do it for yourself i teach you how to simplify the complicated grief in your head and it's so simple when you see it, you're kind of like, oh, well, that, that was pretty easy. And then you know where to start and you know what to work with. So for me, the process right now is I really want to continue to get this into people's hands so that they are having healing right now because, boy, do we need it. And I'm afraid of the PTSD that's going to come up for our children if our parents don't find their balance. And then I'm teaching more practitioners. I'm always, um, the Tapping Academy is, is always running two or three times a year where we have a live training and people can come and learn how to be a tet tapping practitioner. And if you're interested in starting a business or adding tapping to your business, I do this really, it's the only time I use the word kick-ass, do this really kick-ass year long mentoring program where you become a certified uh, tet tapping practitioner while you're learning skills and you're learning to heal yourself and you're building a business at the same time. So those are the two things that are really on my focus right now. Amazing. I love it. And um, where can our, this is now for the podcast listeners real quick, where can our audience find you? So my main website, website is janluther.com and the Healing Your Grief program. Um, I think Jenny has that in her, in her package, but it's under healingyourgrief.us. But if you, you print out the handout that she's giving you, which is, is really kind of cool, it has tapping points in there. It has a picture of the tapping points. It has um, instructions on how to do some gentle, gentle tapping for yourself. It has a script in there. Um, and then there are like 31 affirmations that you can tap through that I, I was very, trying to be very mindful to make sure I kind of covered all mindsets and, and needs to help shift your energy really, really quickly. And then the link is in the bottom of that. To me, that's usually the easiest way. It's just the, the last page should have a link there that you can go right to the right page. Okay, wonderful. And we'll link to everything, of course, in the podcast notes. And if you're watching us on YouTube, you now get to see an example of tapping. If you're listening to the podcast, switch to YouTube. As I said, I'm going to link to that. And so, yeah, that's what we're going to do now. What are we tapping on today? 
So what I like to do is I've had so much fun tapping with whomever is interviewing me and whoever is working because I really feel you know your audience. You have the pulse of what's on their heart and mind. So what I would like to do is just ask you, what is the top of mind concern or distress that you've been thinking about or feeling in the last few days? I think it would be anxiety about the future, especially with the situation right now. I think it's really important that we tap on that. And if we combine that with our theme today, endurance, then I think we'd have a great, um, great start. Awesome. So when you think about the future and, and the questions that ego pop up, what are a couple of phrases that it's the fear phrases that it might come up with? Cause that's always helpful for me. Um, to me as a traveler and as somebody who likes their freedom, it's like, you know, when can we ever not wear masks again and, and be free to go where we want to go. And, um, our children, like if I, you know, have children one day, like what kind of world will they grow up in? And also now with, 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 with what's going on in the U S with all the racism, like, what is this world turning into? Right. And like we said before, um, I want to focus on the bigger picture, but then if I focus on right now, obviously my ego goes like, Oh, but this is happening right now. Da, 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 rather than like, just relax. This is all going to be okay. <laughs> you need to go through this right now to be better and so on and so forth. Right. So what we do with tapping, um, is, and I, I want to just comment that this is a perfect example of, we start with a phrase or two, and then we hit what I call an emotional geyser, right? Is it's like, well, you know, it's what, how are things going to go? Anxiety for the future. And then and we know we've hit a, a, an important thing because it becomes five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. <laughs> it's this and this and this and this and this and this. To me, that's a really good sign that we're on something that really matters and that we can do some great work on. So what I do is on a scale of zero to 10, I'm going to ask her to tell me how high the distress is on each of the phrases that she's given me. And then we'll figure out where to start. So when you just think about anxiety and the future, generic, how much distress is on that? Eight. When you think about, I'm a traveler, when am I gonna be free to travel? 10. <laughs> yep, right, it's the things that matter most to us, absolutely. And then when will I be able to not wear a mask on a schedule of 10? Eight. Okay. Um, when will I be free? And notice this is a different aspect of the, the travel. It's the word free. When will I feel free to go and travel? On a scale of 10? Nine. Yeah. And then thinking about the future and my children. On a scale of 10? Nine. Okay. And then watching the racism and the riots in America. That's a, Dave, that's a 10. <laughs> that's a 10. And so what we do when we're tapping is we're going to tap on meridian points that an acupuncturist might use to put needles in, but we're very specific about where they are. And so I'm going to try to talk the listener through as well. Um, but the two things that come to mind that I feel are really important is recognizing that the minute my ego starts going past tomorrow into some future date, the natural reaction is anxiety because I'm powerless. Ego can't fix it. It can't give me the answer. It, it literally creates anxiety to not be in this presence. And so anytime that we're doing that, we want to give ourselves permission to go, okay, let's write it down, tap on it, of course, but my peace is here because I only have this moment being very present. So we might do some of that as well. Um, and the other thing that I feel like I'd like to share, just because I'm not sure how the tapping will go, I always just do it intuitively, is I would like for us to recognize especially in the United States, that what looks like the craziest politics, the craziest COVID in control, the, I mean, I've, <clears throat> excuse me, I talk to people all day long and they talk about things like the conspiracy theories and right, anytime we look at all these big things, I want us to remember that we're in a world of contrast. So there's light and there's darkness. And I actually have trained my brain to get excited when I see chaos and, and craziness because that tells me the light is rising so fast that we're getting ready to come to a pinnacle point. We're getting ready to come to a tipping point where enough is enough and we have to all choose. It's a sifting. Pick your side. Do you like racism? Do you like a, 
crappy political system do you like right if that's if that's your thing and you're going to defend it okay we know your side but for those of us who want peace and who want want our children to know who they are when they're born and have the gifts and, and spiritual abilities that they have that's the part we want to lean into but we can't do it without removing some of the layers so the first tapping point is called the karate chop and it's actually on the fleshy side of your dominant hand so for me that's my right hand and we would either tap it with fingertips yeah, or tap, either yep or tap both sides or we're actually i was taught to do it as a karate chop so i turn my other palm up and i actually pretend i'm chopping wood with the side of my hand and we're going to tap this and i'm going to ask Ginny to just give me I'm going to give her the phrases and then she's going to give them back and then I'm going to intuit where they need to go. So it's very simple. I would call this like, it's just follow me. Right? It's like Simon says, do this, do this. So even though I'm thinking about the future. I know that there's a bigger perspective with the best uh, or with the best in mind for all of us. And when I can't stay focused on that, we need to stay in the negative first. We got to stay with the, with the fear. So even though I'm worried about the future, just repeat after me. Even though I'm worried about in the, being in the future. And when will I get to travel? And when will I get to stop wearing my mask? When will I get to travel? When will I uh, get to stop wearing a mask? I want to recognize how that feels to have that thought. I want to recognize how that feels to have that thought. Does it make my wall go up? Do I contract? Does it make my wall go up? Do I contract? Or do I feel open? Or do I feel open? I'm open to the idea. I'm open to the idea. That every thought has energy. That every thought has energy. So they just showed me this really funny picture of, you know how people will do the little maze thing? It's not dominoes, but the, you click this and it, the ball rolls and then it clicks down there. And, right? Do you know what I'm talking about? I don't know what those are called. Yeah. Yeah, and then <laughs> the bucket, right, as it kicks the bucket and the water pours out. What they're showing me is this is how ego gets us, is it's just one thought, but it triggers and triggers and triggers and triggers and triggers, right? This chain mm -hmm. reaction. So it's really important that we name the initial so that I can start seeing the chain reaction. So even though when I start thinking about the future and I feel anxious. Even though when I start thinking about the future and I feel anxious. My ego thinks it's got to figure this crap out. My ego thinks it's got to figure this crap out. I deeply and completely. I deeply and completely. Love and appreciate. Love and appreciate. That I can tell by how it feels. That I can tell? By how it feels. By how it feels. That that's not my business today. That that's not my business today. It makes me feel tight and clenched and afraid. It makes me feel tired and clenched and afraid. And it cuts off my intuition. And it cuts off my intuition. And my goal is to always be in alignment with my intuition. And my goal is to always be in alignment with my intuition. So you might use different words. You know, whoever's listening, you might use my spirit, my higher self. Um, I just like to use intuition because it doesn't have a whole lot of other no Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we're gonna do one more time. Even though thinking about the future makes me anxious. Even though thinking about the future makes me feel anxious. And then I get ready to run, I want to travel. And then I get ready to run, I want to travel. I'm open to the idea today. I'm open to the idea today. That I do believe the time will come. That I do believe the time will come. And that I can have endurance and patience. And that I can have endurance and patience. And try to tune into the work that wants to be done in this break. And try to tune into the work that wants to be done in this break. So let's take a breath. Any of that, is that all okay? Am I on the right page? Yeah, absolutely. Especially with the work that needs to be done right now, whether it's on, you know, for the listeners also, whether it's on yourself or on a project in the house or whatever that is for you, like that's really what, what you focus on right now. Right. So let's come to the top of the head. This idea that I'm going to be able to figure out the future is crazy. This idea that I'm going to be able to figure out the future is crazy. Can you see the eyes? But ego sure loves to stir that pot. But ego sure wants to stir that pot. Side of the eyes. It wants me to get nervous about somebody else is going to control my mood. It wants me to get nervous about somebody else is going to try to control my mood. <laughs> yep. Good, good, good. Under the eyes. That someone else is going to control my freedom. Somebody else is going to control my freedom. Under the nose. Maybe part of what we're learning here 
Maybe part of what we're learning here. Andrew Chin, is that freedom is a state of mind. Is that freedom is a state of mind. Let's take a nice deep breath. Collarbone. A part of me absolutely knows the day will come. A part of me absolutely knows the day will come. That I'll get to travel again. That I'll get to travel again. I don't think we'll have masks for all of eternity now. I don't think we'll have masks for all of eternity now. Under the arm. Um, the under the arm one is on the bra line strap for people who can't see that. I'd like to be open to the idea. I'd like to be open to the idea. That it's not my job to figure that out. That it's not my job to figure that out. I don't have the power. I don't have the power. My crystal ball is on the fritz. Sorry? My crystal ball is on the fritz. My crystal ball is on the fritz? Yeah, fritz press means it's not, it's broken. It's kind of zzz. Ah, I never heard that, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Bottom of both ribs. And I'm open to the idea. And I'm open to the idea. That there must be a reason that I have this special time that there must be a reason that I have this special time to work on myself or my projects. To work on myself or my projects. And I'd like to find gratitude in this time. And I'd like to find gratitude in this time. So let's take a little breath. And I'm just going to do a little quick tune in. Anything pop up for you as we were doing that? What's popping up for me right now is to listen to my intuition and to always ask, you know, stay in the moment and ask like, what is right for me to do right now? What can I do to make myself feel happy right now in this moment? And just stick with that rather than letting the thoughts keep going. Yeah, perfect. So let's do another, or another round and then we'll test your numbers. Even though there's a part of me. Even though there's a part of me. That we could call our ego. That we could call our ego that wants to get me spun up and out of this moment. That wants to get me spun up and out of this moment. That wants to take all my energy and attention to some future. That wants to take all my energy and attention to some future. That I know nothing about. <laughs> that I know nothing about and nobody else knows either. <laughs> right. And then it starts getting afraid that, oh no, I don't know. And then it starts getting afraid about, oh, I don't know. And then it has me. And then it has me. I've been hijacked by that ego fear. I've been hijacked by that ego fear. Because if I let it keep spinning. Because if I let it keep spinning. I cannot stay centered and grounded. I cannot stay centered and grounded. I am capable of doing this. I am capable of doing this. Take a nice deep breath. Ooh. So even though. <sighs> even though. I'm asking unanswerable questions. I'm asking unanswerable questions. Not helpful. Not helpful. Not good for my moment. Not good for my moment. And hard to stay on task. And hard to stay on task. If my mind is running to some future that I have no power over. If my mind is running to some future that I have no power over. Or some past that I can't change. Or some past that I can't change. I'm going to lose all my energy and focus. I'm going to lose all my energy and focus. Top of the head. There are times to do the work. There are times to do the work. Bring to the eyes and to clear that energy. And to clear that energy. Out of the eyes. There are times to put a stop to what ego is doing to me. There are times to put a stop to what ego is putting to me. Doing or saying. Yes. Doing to me. Just saying to me. Yeah, out of the eyes. I'm giving my ego mind notice that I've caught you now. I'm giving my ego mind notice that I've caught you now. And the nose. Unanswerable questions make me feel distressed. Unanswerable questions make me feel distressed. And you tune. I'm tuning in to what can I do right here, right now. I'm tuning in into what can I do right here, right now. Collarbone. I want to be centered. I want to be centered. And inspired in all my words and actions. And inspired in all my words and actions. Under the arm. That's actually where I start finding my hope. That's actually where I start finding my hope. Mother is, that's where I'll find my inspiration. That's where I'll find my inspiration. And that's where my endurance becomes easy. And that's where my endurance becomes easy. Because I'm not resisting. Because I'm not resisting. Or writing fear stories anymore. Or writing fear stories anymore. So let's take a breath. I noticed I was watching kind of as your mind was, was rambling and running. 
So I'm going to invite you and anyone else that was doing this to make some notes afterwards of where was it going, what was popping up. But this is where we come back, and this is where it's measurable. Is I'm going to ask you. Uh, yeah. Right? <laughs> I was getting so inspired. I was like, what am I going to write after this? <laughs> um, so on a scale of zero to ten, anxiety about the future. How does that feel in your body right now? Zero to ten. Two. Yeah. Um, but I'm a traveler. When will I get to travel again? On a scale of zero to two, zero to ten. Excuse me. One. Yeah, I heard two. So I, that's right. on a scale of eight to ten, um, when will we be able to not wear masks? Notice that it's the flip even even the opposite. Um, zero. Okay. Um, this. When will I be free to go? Two. Okay. What about my children in this future world? Two. And the racism and the bigger picture in the USA on a scale of 10? Three. Yeah. So notice that they all came down by half or more just by calming the energy down and getting, and, and as I was saying, when we start the fight, flight, and freeze that's happening in your brain, the body starts calming. And I also want to share that I now feel a lot lighter and I get so much inspiration while we were doing this, while I was like, I mean, I still had to pay attention to Jen because I had to repeat her words, but at the same time, my mind was like, okay, I can write this, I can do this, blah, blah, blah. like I was getting so inspired of what I could do now in the moment. And I was like, wait. <laughs> so that, yeah. That is the beauty is notice that we were already doing exactly what you'd asked for was tuning into intuition and guidance for what should I do now? And it was coming in so fast that I was like, just keep saying after me, just keep saying Right as I could feel it coming in, so I've got this one. It was coming in so fast. I'm like, just hanging here with me, Jenny. Well, I was done. <laughs> it's such a powerful process, and our intuition and our spirit know exactly what to do. Our ego might resist in the beginning. It's like, no, I don't want to let go because I'm juicing all this pain and fear. But you do this a few times, and with this recording, you can do the, do the exact same couple of rounds that we've just done, and have even more and better results. So, thank Absolutely. you, Jenny. Nicely done. Thank you too. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time, your being here, your wisdom and everything. I love you. I love you too, girl. You, you <laughs> too. And it's so fun to be in America and to know that there are these points of light around the world that we're connecting to now, which hello, thank you for technology, right? I just, oh, it's a beautiful time exactly. to be here. It really is a beautiful time to be on the planet. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, you want to stop recording real quick so that and then do you want to um, do, do you want to do a closing comment first instead of just going to that mm, yes <laughs> ah okay okay so all right so thank you jen for being on here i really appreciate everything that you do for this world for us as humans really <laughs> and um i appreciate you being on this podcast today or on this youtube video and I wish you all the best. And I hope people are checking out the Healing Your Grief program because it is very, very powerful. Um, I can attest to that because me, I've worked with Jen for a long time and it's been amazing, always. And um, yeah, if you like this content, subscribe and like this video, share this with you with anybody who's feeling a little bit anxious or um, scared about the future so that uh, the tapping can help them as well. Awesome. Thank you, thank you, Jenny. And know that I think about you all day long and I hope you feel me loving at you. <laughs>